Okay. The recording is on. Welcome everyone to the class. Um, may I request somebody just to pray and we will get started. Would like to pray. Okay, Asharani, would you like to pray? Uh, thank you so much for this day, Lord. And as we're about to learn about the urban church, God, I pray that your spirit will pour out and as learn the heart for your cities, God. That, Lord, may we have the right attitude towards the cities and the nations that you have called us or for the destination, Lord. Thank you so much, God, for this opportunity to learn about the churches and the planters, God. In the name we pray. Amen. Oh, amen. Okay, I couldn't hear clearly what you prayed, but I'm just saying amen. All right. So, welcome. Good morning. Uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, uh, BC309 Urban Church Planting. We are uh, continuing uh, this week. It's our second lecture this week on urban church planting. And uh, we're going to um, pick up from where we paused yesterday. We'll go ahead and share um, the post notes and uh, we will move forward. All right, so yesterday we kind of stated or we stated our objective in church planting. That is, we are looking or we are working toward establishing a community of believers who would uh, host God's presence, that basically they will be God's people in that place. And therefore God is dwelling among them. They're hosting the presence of God. They're hosting God in that place uh, because we are the temple of God. And then not only that, but we are growing here as disciples of the Lord Jesus. And then we also have influence or impact our communities, the region around us and even regions beyond us so that we can plant more churches and so on. And then as new people keep coming in, the same thing happens. They continue to be disciples and then they become part of this whole community that is uh, impacting their region. So that's our objective in planting a church, right? So we're not just looking at building a church building or we're not just looking at putting up a structure, but we're talking about something that is going to continue uh, it's self-sustaining and hopefully will continue over time, uh, just, just reproducing in, uh, the kingdom of God. Now, today we're going to get into chapter four. And in chapter four, uh, I want to emphasize uh, that one of the things, very important things, when we are looking to plant a church in a city or in a region or in a village or a town, wherever, is that we must get God's heart for that place. So I, 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 I'm just using a generic title, get God's heart for cities. But for each of us personally, we need to make it personal and specific. That means wherever God's placed you, um, you need to get God's heart for that place. Or maybe I could put it like this. You need to be able to have God's heart for that place. and. And, and feel what God feels towards that city. And when I say city, we are obviously talking about the people in that city, uh, what people are experiencing, what people are going through, you know, uh, we need that. Now, uh, as we will see later on, uh, that getting God's heart for the city is very important. And we will explain why. Uh, uh, and, and if we don't have the heart of God, for the city where we are, it is very easy for us to get disillusioned, uh, and maybe discouraged, and sometimes we even get uh, disgruntled, we get upset with the people in, in the city. And, and that can really disrupt you know, uh, the work that we intend in doing uh, in establishing uh, God's work in that city. So, to begin with, you know, uh, God himself identifies with city. Uh, very specifically, if you want to look at it that way, in Matthew 5.35, you know, Jesus refers to Jerusalem 
as the city of the great king. So you can imagine Jerusalem is a physical city and he's calling this Jerusalem the city of the great king. So God is identifying himself with that city, you know, the city of the great king. So don't swear by anything, no, not, by, you know, not even by Jerusalem because that's the city of the great king. Uh, Jerusalem is a city of the great king. Now, uh, God is very observant and he's very cognizant and he's very aware of all that's happening in the city. You know, sometimes we think, we look at our cities, we look at all the problems in the city, uh, uh, you know, whatever, whether it's corruption, whether it's uh, infrastructure problems, whether it's violence, whether it's hate, whether it's crime, all kinds of city could be infested with all kinds of problems. And sometimes we wonder, you know, like, is God even noticing all of this that's going on? And we can see in scripture, and I've only mentioned two, but you could see it in many places in scripture, that God, what happens in the city is noticed by God. Take, for example, Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 18. You know, God is looking. God has been looking at Sodom and Gomorrah, and it comes to the point where he says, you know, it's almost like, you know, God is waiting for, has a high, high water mark uh, for the sin. Uh, and, 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 and it's like it reaches that threshold, it reaches that mark. God says it's like the stench of the city uh, and the sins of the city have come up before me. You know, so that God says, okay, this has reached this limit where you know, I need to do something, I need to, you know, step in. The same thing with Nineveh, if you, if you, if you look at uh, the book of Jonah, chapter 1 and also in chapter 4, it's because of the sins of the city have come up so much that God says, you know, I need to do something. And in this case, I need to send a messenger in to warn the people. So he sends Jonah. He says, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to preach to the city. Uh, and, uh, and, and then we know the story of Jonah. You know, he very reluctantly tries to avoid it. And then very reluctantly he gets there and preaches to the city. And you know, he knows these people are going to repent and God will forgive. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. And uh, then, you know, in chapter four, when Jonah is so upset that, uh, that, you know, the people have repented and God is extending grace, mercy to them. And then God says, Jonah, in Jonah chapter four, he says, Jonah, don't you have compassion on these people? Now, these people don't even know the, the right hand or the left, you know, and, and, and you're angry that I didn't judge them. I'm just paraphrasing what, what, what God is speaking with Jonah. But God is so concerned about the people. He wants to redeem the city. He wants to redeem the people. And he will try different ways. So God's first reaction is not judgment. First, God's response is, you know, let's see if we can redeem the city. Let's see if we can do something uh, to draw people to myself. Right? So we get a sense here of what of God's heart to the city. When there is uh, evil, when there is sin, God is always redemptive. Right? He wants to do something to redeem uh, the people, uh, redeem the city. And, and we, we can see in examples, even in, in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 59, you know, we know that chapter where Isaiah is talking about all the sins of the city. And God says, you know, I look for a man, I look for an intercessor to stand in the gap so that the city may not be judged. You know? So that's the heart of God towards the city. And, and then very interestingly, Luke, the 19th chapter, verse 41 to 44. Can somebody read that? Luke 19. And then I want us to just discuss a little bit why Jesus weeps over the city of Jerusalem. He weeps over the city. Right? So it's very interesting. Jesus is weeping over a city, the city of Jerusalem. And let's try to think after we read these verses, you know, why did Jesus weep over the city of Jerusalem? So could somebody read Luke 19, 41 to 44, and then let's try to answer that question. Now, as you look here, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make, make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. 
for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children with you to the ground, and they will not leave leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Mm. Yeah. So let's just think about this. You know, this verse 41, it says, he drew near the city, he saw the city and wept over it. It is very touching, very touching one. So why, and I'll just stop sharing so we can uh, see what's going on here. Why, you know, he just saw the city, he wept over it. Why did Jesus weep over the city of Jerusalem? What 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 thoughts come to your mind as as you look at these verses? Anyone? Anyway, Go ahead, Shikamar. Thank you, Pastor. Maybe um, as by my understanding, they have not recognized the Messiah, uh, the Messiah which was promised to them. I I think that is one one area where Jesus wept. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. They didn't recognize Jesus as Messiah. Okay. Good. Any, any other thoughts? Please. He saw the city, he wept over it. Why did Jesus, why was he moved like that? I don't know. Uh, can you Go say ahead. that because the people in the city and the rulers of the city didn't uh, understand the ways of God, so it's the, the end time and what's written by the prophets, so that they can avoid the uh, trouble that will come, they will follow after. Mm. So you're saying they, sorry, my God, I was trying to, trying to, they didn't recognize what had been spoken that's what you're saying right there yes yeah they didn't recognize what was what was spoken by prophets so they could avoid um, mm. calamity mm. okay yeah. uh, kennedy yeah. says uh, they are missing god's visitation okay just for you're going to say something yes i was just going to say that uh, this actually happened i think during the uh, during you know, Jesus is uh, a triumphant entry into, uh, you know, into the uh, into the city. Uh, but he also realized that um, the same people who were, you know, you know, praising and worshiping him, you know, saying Hosanna, they would they would actually turn against him, reject him, and uh, eventually, uh, you know, choose to, uh, I mean, rather want to uh, crucify him. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, you know, he felt that yeah, he, may, he must have felt that you know that level of uh, sorrow. Okay, so you're you're looking at it from that these very people are going to turn, uh, you know, turn around or turn against him, and put them on the cross. Okay, the very pe people of the same city, yeah, who at that time are celebrating, welcoming him in. Okay. Uh, I see what Rose is written. Uh, they rejected him, and these cities would later suffer the consequences of judgment from God. So he cried to them. He wanted Jerusalem to be hidden under his wings like a hand that it's proved that they reject him. Yeah. Yeah. So he's seeing what's going to happen to them uh, because of their rejection. And yeah, there's this, this judgment of God that's going to come because they reject him. Yeah. Asha. Uh, they were doing something that's not right to Jesus' eyes. Okay. All right. So, you know, um, uh, uh, I guess, you, you know, the, the different ones have looked at it from different aspects. And, and so, if we, if we sum it up, if we sum it up, and, and this essentially is what verse 42 captures for us, it's the spiritual condition of the city. 
right? Everything that we've all said is it, all is all correct. It's, it's all correct. But really, what happened is the city is not recognizing what God is doing in the spiritual realm, right? So, you know, in the natural things all going on in the city, Jerusalem, everybody thinks everything is okay. But in the spiritual realm, they are missing something. You know, God has come in the person of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And everything he's come to bring to them is being missed. Verse 42, basically, they have hidden the things that were meant for their good, for their well-being. They're just missing everything because their eyes are, their eyes can't see. Right? Verse 42, hidden from your eyes. And consequent, as a consequence, there's going to be this series of things happen. There's going to be destruction and so on. Yeah? But if you look at it, if you want to just put it in one sentence, everything what we have all said is correct. But if you want to put it in one sentence, it's the spiritual condition of the people. Right? They are missing out what, what, what God is doing in the spiritual while they're just so busy with everything that's going on. You know, their eyes are blinded. And therefore, they don't see the day of the visitation. They don't see that the Messiah has come. Uh, they don't understand what the prophets have spoken. And there is going to be this tremendous judgment coming upon them because of the rejection of the Messiah and so on. They are going to nail the Messiah to the cross. Uh, all this they're going to do, spiritually they're blind. So Jesus is weeping over the spiritual condition of the city. So the question we need to ask is, are we moved by the spiritual condition of the place where we are? Okay. I know we, we may all be troubled by natural things, like, you know, if the roads are bad, if, uh, there's a lot of potholes on the road, or if there is violence or crime or injustice, corruption, all those things. So all those things do disturb us. But does the spiritual condition of the city in which we live cause us to weep over the city? It is a question, it's a thought. And I want to invite us you know, that into this place where, like Jesus, and I'm not saying we should force this, I'm not saying we should make it up. What I'm saying is our heart towards God and towards the the city, place wherever he's placed you, right? It should be so tender that we also, like Jesus, we forward the city, basically the spiritual condition of the city of the people. He saw the city, he wept over it, because their eyes were blinded, they didn't know the things that were meant for their peace, that were meant for their well-being, which would all, you know, thereafter, there's going to be all these consequences. So think about it. Does the spiritual condition of your city make you weep over that city? May you feel what God feels for your city. Now, let me just go forward with this note here. Sure. Okay. So, the other thing when we talk about cities, villages, and towns, you know, God's hand is involved. The Bible tells us this in Acts 17. And if somebody could turn there. So uh, Paul is preaching at Athens. And in, as part of his sermon, uh, he makes the statement when it comes to the places where people dwell. And today we would refer to them as cities and towns and villages. But he makes this statement here in Acts 17. 26 and 27, somebody could read it for us, please. Acts 17, 26, 27. Acts 17, 26, 27. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps 
feel their way toward him and find him. Yet, he's actually not far from each one of us. Hmm. Thanks. Very interesting. Thank you. So Paul is in Athens. Okay. Uh, so this uh, we will un we understand at that time was the intellectual capital of the world. All these great philosophers, you know, Socrates and others, uh, just in a couple of centuries before Paul had come. And so today, this this Athens is like this big intellectual capital. People are very, you know, intellectual and so on. So when he's speaking to these people. Notice what he says. He says, God, verse 26, he has made from one blood every nation of men, and he has determined, God has determined their pre-appointed times, so the, the time, the rise and the fall of nations, and also the boundaries of their dwellings. Interesting. That means God, in his own way, has been involved in the establishing of these dwellings where people dwell. So you could look at it either from the context of a village or a town or a city or a nation, that God has been involved in this, where people are dwelling. So if we apply this to a city or, or, or whatever that dwelling is, whether it's village or town, we need to say, God, your hand was involved in determining this that people would live here. And for what purpose? The next verse says, so that they would seek the Lord. So somehow, in the establishing of these dwellings, there is the underlying intent of God that people would seek the Lord and might grope for him, would search for him and find him. Now, uh, when you uh, when you read when if you if you take a look at that book uh, um, turning our cities for God by John Dawson, so he explains that in the establishing of our cities there is a redemptive story because it, verse twenty seven says you know that God put put them in their dwellings and and there was a there was an underlying intent that these people would search for him and seek for him and find him. So this is God's design. And I'm not going to expand on that, uh, that about the redemptive, you know, the, the thing that there is a redemptive story in every, that you can find a redemptive story in every city uh, through which, you know, people can be drawn to God. Don't elaborate on that. But what I do want to emphasize is that God's intent for every for people in every dwelling, in every city, is that they should seek him. So this is God's heart for the city. That wherever people are, you know, whether it's a small town or a village or a very big city, God has put them there, and there is this intent of God for people to come searching for him, seeking for him, and find him in that city. So this is the same heart we must have towards the place where we dwell. Right? So for us, okay, so those of us here in Bangalore locally, it's Bangalore City for those of you different places. And whatever city you're dwelling, understand the reason that God's hand was in, involved in the setting up of that dwelling and part of what he wanted to accomplish was in that place, people should come searching for him and find him. Right? So, Let's think about this and, you know, we will uh, just, you know, why is it important for us to receive and, uh, or to develop or, you know, to inculcate in ourselves? And, and then this may happen gradually. I'm not saying it'll happen in an instant, but why is it important for us to consciously receive or develop or nurture God's heart for our city? And I think God's heart, I mean, we feel what God feels. We also know what God knows. We also see what God sees. And we also move what moves the heart of God. It means we are behind God's heart for our city. And then when we do ministry in the city, we should operate out of God's heart for our city. So just wanted to want to hear your thoughts. 
why is it important for us to have God's heart for our city? Um, feel free to share your thoughts. Why do we, you know, why can't we just go about it with doing it like a business, or doing it like an organization, or do it like a like a denominational whatever? Why should we come from God's heart for our city? The work that we do, the prayers that we pray. Why is God getting God's heart for us to be important? Anyone? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, uh, I think um, then only we can genuinely and uh, you know faithfully serve the Lord because um, we carry that um, the love for God and the, the vision of God. We we mingle with the with the desires of God. So I believe that uh, without that thing, uh, we cannot able to accomplish what God wants us to do for that particular city. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Okay. I see the other comments in the chat. Thank you, Sri Kumar. I see the other comments that we could carry out his will for that city. How he sees things solved will be carried out. Rose shares that. Thank you. Anita says, it can happen not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of God. Thanks, Anita. Tarun shares to pray right and do his will. Thank you, Tarun. Anyone else? Can I share this? Good, good. Go ahead, Avni. Yeah, so uh, as it is written in Isaiah 55, 8 onwards, that his ways are higher than our ways. So sometimes mm -hmm. we don't understand things and we see it in human perspective or with eyes, uh, physical eyes, but God mm -hmm. says by faith. So uh, his ways are higher and he wants to save him. That is his heart. He does not want anyone to perish. We may judge people by the ways they live, by the ways, but his ways are higher and he says, I want to accomplish my will. I want to save people. So when we pray according to His will, He will put forth, uh, put the love in our hearts when we pray, and that mm -hmm. uh, prayer will be more effective. And uh, and and mm -hmm. moreover, when God will save the city, we will be partakers of that uh, blessing also. Mm -hmm. All right. Good. Good. Thank you all for sharing. You know, all of these things are valid. Valid. Thoughts, right, so that we could have God's heart, God's vision, see the way, see it the way God sees it. Now we could love, even when sometimes the city may be repulsive. You know, for example, I'm just saying example. Maybe there are some things, there are things in the city that make you feel like, man, I need to get out of the city. And honestly, sometimes you know, uh, even I felt pretty upset with the city where I am, uh, like, man, when is, when is all this going to change? Or maybe I should just go away to a less crowded city and be calm and quiet. Because things here can be so uh, stressful, you know? I'm just kidding. I'm just telling you honestly. Sometimes you feel like that. But then when you have God's heart, say, so, okay, okay, it, it, it may be true that there are all these unpleasant things. Uh, there may be all these things going on. But then, what does God feel, right? And then from that perspective, you know, we can do our work, we can pray, uh, God will give us strategies for the city, God will tell us, you know, whom, you know, which, which, so many things that just flow out of the heart of God to us as we do the ministry. And I like that, the process that we will carry out his will for the city, right? Uh, we will get his mind for the city, you know, uh, we can solve problems. We can, as Tarun says, that we can pray correctly for the city. We can depend, as Anita says, we can depend on the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, and, uh, and Asha said something. We come out from our comfort zone, have God attitude, right towards uh, towards the city, have right attitude. So all these things come only when we get His heart for the city. Uh, if we otherwise, in the natural, it's so easy. And sometimes it gets very discouraged. And I, I have known people, you know, the ministry, they come, they start the ministry. Uh, after two years, they get so discouraged in the city. And they they backed up and left. And it's like, I cannot handle this anymore. 
because it takes it, you know, because the, the things in the city can be quite discouraging. And, it, and it's only when we have the heart of God can we have that endurance and the determination to stay and say, I am going to serve. I am going, you know, because you're operating out of God's heart rather than just, you know, our, our own natural passion, our own natural, you know, in desire. You know? So for all of these reasons, it's so important to operate, always constantly stay with the heart. How, what does God see in the city? What does God want done in the city? How does God want to reach the city? Yeah? And we can, you know, we don't have to, we, we, we don't have to be constrained by, you know, the, the things that we see around us in the city. So, very good. Uh, we will take this forward here. Uh, oops. So, uh, we must be interested in the well-being of our city and pray for our city. In Jeremiah 29, uh, verses 7 and 8, it's a very interesting passage, uh, especially when you look at the context, right? So, in the Jewish people, some of them have been taken into exile, into Babylon. And they're in a strange city. They're in a totally different environment. Uh, you know, you can imagine... The, the, the whole upheaval that they have gone through as a people to be forcibly uprooted from their own city of Jerusalem and taken into Babylon. And the Jeremiah is speaking to them, okay? And this is Jeremiah's word, right? the word of the Lord through Jeremiah. And God is telling him, I want you to seek the peace of the city. I want you to pray to the Lord for that city, for in its peace you will have peace. I want you to plant vineyards and build houses, and I want you to settle down and enjoy the city. You know, so this is God's word through Jeremiah to His people who were in exile in a foreign city. You know, in a, you know, they've gone through a lot, and yet God is saying, "I want you to pray for the city. I want you to seek the peace of the city." Right? So that should be our heart. You know, there would be, there may be many things that are that that feel, that make us feel upset about the city. But we need to maintain God's heart, seek the well-being of the city, pray for it, and say, this is where God has called me to serve him at this point in time. Right? The other thing we must, that we also see in scripture is that God looks for intercessors for the city. Right? And uh, we are all familiar with these verses. I'm not turning there. In Isaiah 59, uh, 14 through 16, you know, uh, as I describes in the, the condition of the city, he says truth has fallen in the street, um, there is no justice, and so on. And in the middle of all that, God says, uh, I looked for a man. I wondered why there was no intercessor for the city. Was someone would stand in the gap. And in Ezekiel 22, 29, 31, it goes the same thing. You know, it describes us, the fallen condition of the city. And then God says, I sought for a man who would stand in the the gap and, and stand the gap and, and, and make up the hedge for the city. So God is looking for people who will intercede for the city. And that's something you and I should constantly be doing. You know, just pray in your heart. As you're, you're moving about in the city, say, God, uh, I pray for the city, God. I pray for the, the salvation of the city. I pray for your mercy on the city. I pray that the people will be drawn into the kingdom in my city. God, I pray that many will know Jesus Christ in my city. I pray the gospel will advance. My city. However, you know, the, the many different prayers we can pray, but God is looking for people who would speak to him on behalf of the city, who would intercede for the city. Right? And another thing we would see, in, especially in the Old Testament, is that part of what the prophets were prophesying was they were speaking the plan of God for various cities and not just for Jerusalem, but for many of the neighboring cities. This is what God is going to do. You know, this is what God is planning to do. And, and, and we would see that, uh, especially in the, right, in, in the writings of the prophets, that God reveals his plan for the city to his prophets. And so if we, as people of God, uh, look to God, stand before him and say, God, show me what you want done in this city. Show me how you want us to move in the city. Show us where you want us, and God will begin to reveal His plan. You know, He will tell us, you know, do this, do that. I'm not saying you know we're going to 
solve everything in the city, but he's going to reveal to each of us different aspects of what he wants us to do in the city. Right? And for us to walk together, Amos 3, and make for us to walk together with God and work with Him, we must be in agreement with Him. Right? So why is it important for us to know His heart? Because only when we are in agreement with Him can we walk with Him and work with Him in the city. Right? If God is, you know, is, is feeling compassion to the city and we are feeling resentful, uh, we are not in agreement with God, we can't work with Him, we can't walk with Him in the city. A couple of other thoughts here in, in getting God's heart for the city. You know, God is much bigger than the city. You know, many times, you know, I, and I'm, I personally have felt overwhelmed. You know, like, God, the city is so big, so complicated, so difficult. You know, uh, I, I, and then I just need to remind myself, you know, the city is like a drop in a bucket before God. Before me, yeah, things are so difficult, complex, got a lot of issues. Um, uh, and that the government may be putting in more and more constraints, or et cetera, et cetera. So for me, in the city, yeah, things seem to be getting more difficult, but God is much bigger than the city. Nothing is too hard for him. And so always we are expecting the God kind of work to come forth. Meaning you are expecting God to touch the city. So that's something that I found very useful, very important. That you know, always remind yourself, God is much bigger than the city. This city is like a drop in a bucket before God. Nothing is too far. So don't let, don't get overwhelmed by the kind of things you see happening in your city. Don't get overwhelmed by it. Right? Isaiah 14, 15, and 17, Jeremiah 30 to 17. Now, is there anything too hard for God? You know, what is anything too difficult for God? Always remind yourself on that. So, what must we do? The first thing, as we prepare for doing church planting in a city or starting any ministry in the city, we have to operate from knowing God's heart. Get God's heart for your city. Uh, learn to see people in the city as God sees them. Uh, be moved with compassion for people in the city the way God has moved. Pray for your city. Right? And, 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 and always come from that place of God's heart for your city. And like Jesus, you pray over the city or even weep over the city. You know, there are there are times when I'm driving and I'm driving across the city and I just, you know, I just cry. Just cry for the city. Just weep over the city. Say, God, these are people who need Jesus. Oh God, these are people who need Jesus. And you look at the multitudes. You look at the crowds of people and you say, God, there are so many people who need Jesus in my city. So you, you, you keep your heart tender towards God for the city. Another interesting thing, uh, this is a, a little deviation, but just it's kind of interesting here, is that uh, when you look at the rewards God is going to give to his people in the millennium, uh, he's going to give authority over cities. This is in Luke 19. You know, so they, this is again this, this, the, the parable of the talents. And then to each one who's been a good steward with what, God has given them. He says, enter. Now, I will give you authority over many cities in the kingdom to come. So we know that uh, in the millennium, we're going to rule and reign with Jesus. And he's going to give us authority over cities. So even at that time, in the millennium, the saints will be involved in administering God's kingdom in cities. Just think about that. So now we are on this side of the millennium. We get to do the spiritual work. On the other side of the millennium, there will be the practical administering work, administrating work, administration work over city. Right? Two, two sides before the millennium. Right now, there's a spiritual work we are doing to see lives touched. On the other side, in the millennium, there's going to be a administering, administering the kingdom of God in cities all over the world. And uh, final thought here. You know, the Bible closes with a picture of a holy city. New Jerusalem, God is himself putting his city here on the planet. Right? And he says, and this is a huge city uh, you know, that, that God will bring down on, on earth. And we are going to dwell with him in a city. You know? So that's just something to keep in mind. So overall, God is very interested in the city. Okay. Uh, 
uh, and we need to operate from that place. Any questions here before I jump into the next chapter? Everyone with me so far? Okay, Srikumar, you have a question? Yes, yes, Pastor. Uh, Pastor, I want to know um, uh, how we come to know that uh, God has called us in this particular city and uh, and we have to pray for this city. But uh, is there any, uh, like, um, uh, like we know that uh, specifically when um, uh, do the ministry and uh, no, we, we will understand our call. So in the same way, how we come to know that uh, this is the city where God wants us to plant a church. As you said that, because when we see the cities, we will get upset and, uh, you know, so many things are happening. So how we come to know that this is the city where God wants uh, me or, uh, you know, someone to mm -hmm. plant a church or a ministry. Thank you, Pastor. Mm -hmm. Very interesting question. <laughs> Um, I'll just share my thoughts and then I'll leave it open for others uh, to share. One is, uh, one is, you see, God is at work in our lives and he's ordering our steps, right? The steps, the Bible says, right? The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So God is ordering our steps. And in that process, as we are journeying with God, if you find yourself in a particular city, then you just take it that this is where God wants you to be, right? And this is where God wants you for that season of your life. Uh, he wants you to be there, and therefore you serve him faithfully in that city. That's one way to look at it. The other way is sometimes God may speak to you specifically to go to a city. So he may, he may uh, put a passion in your heart for a city. So that, that's a that hasn't necessarily happened to me, other than the fact that I just knew, and, and this may be more of a natural thing, I grew up in this city and I just felt this is, I, I need to come back and start work from here. So that's, it was very, uh, I would say, more of a first, first time. But some people may have God put a certain city in their heart and say, I want you to go there, and I want you to do it. So either way, God is leading. You know, one is a very natural thing. Your steps are ordered. You find yourself in a city. Then you just serve God faithfully in that city. Sometimes God may put a certain city in your heart uh, to serve there, and you do that. You know, and, and maybe in my own experience, uh, one one experience I can just share. Then I'll open it up for others. Uh, this was way back in 1992. Uh, uh, and I was in, 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 in the U.S. at that time, and then suddenly God just felt I needed to go to Eastern Europe. You know, I didn't know why. You have to go to Eastern Europe. And uh, I didn't know too much, but I went to the pastor of the church where I was saying, uh, attending, and I told him, you know, uh, do you, I asked him, do you have any contact in Eastern Europe? Uh, I just want to go there uh, to minister. And sure enough, you know, they were in touch with the missionary who was in Albania, and so I ended up going there. So in that case, just one example I think that I can think of was you know, a certain region was put in my heart for that particular time, and I just followed the prompting. So like that, God can definitely put cities in hearts of people saying, I want you to go there, I want you to minister there. Let me obey God. I just want to open it up to the rest of the class. You know, if you have thoughts on Sri Kumar's question, you're welcome to share. You know, how can somebody know that a particular city is where you're supposed to be? Okay, so Avani shared, yeah, definitely it can come through a dream or a vision, you know, and I'm just thinking about Matthew chapter 2, where in a dream, God told Joseph, Joseph, go down to Egypt, you know. So this is a very clear word. You have got to go to Egypt. He didn't say any other place. Egypt, you have to go. You know, so he kind of moved uh, Mary and Joseph there for that season. Anyone else? So, Pastor, my follow-up question on this question: Like, we can see a city in the dream. We may have a vision, but we do not know the name of the city. So then, uh, how do we identify that? God is giving you a burden for a city through a dream or a vision, but 
uh, will he also show you the will he also give some other sign to make sure that this is the particular city that god wants you to pray for or go to and minister like you got a clear uh, name of that place like uh, i'm sure god will you know like if, if god wants us to go to a particular place he will put the pieces of the puzzle together right so maybe there is initially a, a sense of okay what the city will look like then you begin to pray and say, God, you know, where is this place? Where do you want me to go? And God will guide you there. You know, uh, He will open up this, the, the, the way to go there. I, I'm sure, like, as we seek the Lord uh, further for more details, uh, He will bring it to us different ways, you know, through second dreams or just orchestrating situations, people in our path. Yeah. Any other experiences people have had, I'm sure? Um, Rose sharing, God can show a picture, uh, then comes understanding, when we step and surrender, doors open up, yeah, and then we walk into them and, and we go. Yeah, so there's a combination of God giving you a vision, you recognize it, begin to move and then there's open doors, all of these things, you know, God brings together and he directs a path. So usually it happens like that. And then God gives us a sense and then he directs a path. Elisha, go ahead, please. Okay, thank you, Pastor. Pastor, I want to share uh, an experience with uh, the leading of God. Um, with my my denomination, the founder is uh, Pastor James McKeon, who is of blessed memory. For him, um, during a prayer meeting in the in the nineteen um, thirty seven, there was thirty five, of course, thirty five. There was a prophecy, a, a directive prophecy. Um, during a prayer meeting by Ellen Pentecostal Church in the in the UK. And it was direct that he should come to West Africa, then that time Gold Coast, um, and minister. Mm -hmm. So he, he he followed. He initially didn't want to come, but after two years, after personal prayer and reflection on the prophecy, um on 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 1937, um, since March, he arrived in Gold Coast as a missionary. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that is an experience of uh, Pastor James Michael that I would want to share. Thank mm -hmm. you. Good, good. Thank you. Yeah, so it could be a very specific word, you know, like the Holy Spirit told me uh, he gives people um, and uh, yeah, yeah. then people just have to obey. And of course, you pray about it, you seek God's heart about it, and then, then you step out on it. Yeah, so Rose also shares, and then God repeats that to get our attention and, uh, and, and make sure that we get, we get our attention. Then we say, oh, yeah, God is speaking. This is where I need to go. And we step up, okay? But definitely, I think we, you know, we, uh, I guess uh, our time is up, but the main Truth, uh, the main message today is get the heart of God for your city and then always stay in that place. Because a lot of things, if you move out of that place, you could easily get discouraged uh, and so on. So always stay in the place where you're connected to the heart of God for your city and from there, they're going to do all the ministry they're going to do. Okay? So next week, we start getting into the practical side, which is understanding the spiritual and natural dynamics of the city, uh, what it involves, and then how do you, from that place, how do you develop a plan or a strategy for your city? Okay. Uh, yeah, let's close in prayer. Anybody wants to pray, you can do that, please, and then dismiss us. Okay. Go on. Heavenly Father, we... We are grateful, Lord. We are grateful because you, 
even though you, you can do everything by yourself, Lord, you choose to, to include us, Lord, in changing your words in, in the world, in, in, in preaching your word, in impacting cities. We pray, Father, that you, you use us more, Lord. You will you make it clear you that we'll be able to see your vision in the way that we can understand, Lord. Mm-hmm. And not know not knowing what we we, we can do or what where we will go, but we will know what you've called us to do and where you have placed us so that we can walk in the will and in the way you've called us to walk. We pray, Father, that you you'll be with us. And yeah, until we meet again, Lord, we pray. In your mighty name, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Um, yep, so I'll see you on Thursday for our 310 class. God bless. Enjoy. Peace.